should mature mm -hmm. in the teaching. Now, let me say this. The reason why I say that uh, uh, repentance from dead works has nothing to do with salvation is because he just read it in verse 8. Uh, uh, I mean, Romans chapter 5, verse 8. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Uh, you stop sinning is not going to please God. He's already killed his son. <laughs> uh, uh, did, 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 he, did he kill his son, Pastor? Yeah, Reverend, yes. Reverend Thompson? Yes, he says, no man takes my life. No man I, takes my I life. But I lay it down. Lay it and down. I have power uh -huh. or authority to pick it up again. Pick it up again. So you have to, you have to be careful when you're talking about salvation versus sanctification, we, we, we covered that in the last episode. And when we talked about separating the Old Testament from the New Testament. See? Yes, Israel had to repent of their sins. But guess what? Israel had to repent of their sins because all God had already cleansed them and chosen them for a great work for him, pending the coming of their Messiah. Okay. Did I say that right? Yes, sir. <laughs> See, so is, yeah, Israel had to repent of his sins because uh, they receive a, a, a divine blessing from God back in Genesis chapter 12 and 15, Israel received the divine blessing from God in Genesis chapter 12, verses 3, and chapter 15, verses 1 through 16. The origin of Judaism is in Genesis chapter 15, not Exodus. Now that's another, one, another thing you get when you, uh, when you study the Bible with a purpose, Right. And you start listening to what God is saying and not what man is saying that Moses said. See, the origin of, the, of Judaism is in Genesis. Its implementation is in Exodus. Amen. Amen. Man, amen. Man, amen. Man. So, in the, so, so in the last last segment, we we began. We talked about separating the Old Testament from the New. Now, the Old Testament, Genesis to Malachi, is a reference source, but it has no authority over the church. Absolutely zero, no authority over the church. Absolutely none. Because it required, it, the death of Jesus Christ put to an end the law of sin and death that was covered by the Old Testament. We're in a, in a, in a new, new era now. So we've talked about, in the first segment, we talked about separating the Old Testament from the New and we talked about separating, oh no, this is, I'm in verse 2, I'm in the second segment now, separating redemption from reconciliation. That's where we are now. And uh, separating redemption from reconciliation. And we need to turn back to Romans chapter 5, verse 8. And nine and ten, because Romans chapter uh, Romans chapter five verses eight. Uh, if I had to ask the question, I would ask you: Do you know how to separate redemption from reconciliation? Do you know how to separate salvation from sanctification? Do you, do you know uh, salvation, what we must do to be saved, from sanctification, what we must do now that we are saved? See, uh, I'm fixing to make one of those statements again. Uh, sanctification uh, has not, uh, uh, 
uh, there are two sanctifications. One sanctification is an act and the other is a process. Now, if you get the act confused with the process, you're in a world of trouble. You're causing someone to believe a lie. If you get sanctification as an act confused with sanctification as a process. Now, let's, let's, t- let's, t- let's take a reading on Romans chapter 5, verses 8, and we're going to talk about redemption. Now, again, if we're going to talk about redemption, uh, you got to make sure you're at the right place at the right time and you're talking about the right redemption. See? Romans chapter 5, verse 8, is talking about the redemption. The redemption that satisfied God's just demand to punish mankind for sin. That's, that's the redemption we're talking about, the first redemption. I said there's three. And I, hope I, get, I hope I get to cover all three of the different redemption, just like I covered two sanctifications. There are three redemptions. Well, let me tell you so, so I won't confuse you. There's a redemption where God was reconciled to man. That's the first redemption. That's Romans 5, 8. And then when you get to Romans 5, 9, God starts talking about another redemption, a coming redemption. Huh? Let's, look at, let's, let's, let's just read it. Mm-hmm. Uh, verse 9, 5, 9 says, uh, Much more then. Much more then. Being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. We shall be saved from wrath from wrath through him. Through him. You understand what I'm saying? Much more then. Now that God has been reconciled to man. Now let me tell you why the statement that, that, that I have just made is one of the most confusing statements in all the Bible, in all of Christianity. Uh, Now, read that again. Much more then. Much more then. Being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. And I said that's a confusing statement unless you rightly divide the word of truth. Let's, let's divide it. Verse 9, much more then, having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. Now, at first glance, you would think that the Holy Spirit is talking about having now been justified by his blood, you would think he was talking about salvation. But he's talking about redemption. Mm -hmm. Uh Much more than having now been justified by his blood. Uh, How can I put this? Without the shedding of blood, there can be no remission of sin. Amen, amen. Without the shedding of blood. So the death of Jesus Christ in verse 8, 5, 8, that death made possible the, for God to remit our sins. But he was already satisfied. He had to satisfy himself before he could remit 
your sins and mine. But there's one denomination, lump them all together. The minute God was, uh, was satisfied with Jesus' death, they say that uh, he's going to save the whole world or he saved the whole world. Nothing else needs to be done. Not so. M much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. Now, the key here is the word saved. And it's futuristic. Mm. We shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. The, the logical question then is how? And then how we, we move from redemption to salvation and sanctification. The act. The first sanctification, the act. How are you saved? Ephesians chapter 2 verse 8. By grace through faith ye have been saved. And uh, as I was studying uh, for, this, uh, for this show, uh, the, the Spirit brought to my mind that God's grace alone won't save you. And there's a, a denomination out there that believes in irresistible grace. <laughs> irresistible grace. Irresistible grace. There is an irresistible grace. But I'm sorry, I don't want to burst your bubble, but it's not for the Gentile nations of the world. You remember early I, earlier I said that um, this passage of Scripture here, Romans 5, verses 8 to 11, is for all ethnic people groups on the face of the earth except the Jewish people? The reason why is because the Jewish people because they are and they were and still are God's chosen people, they are the one that is subject to God's irresistible grace. Why? Because he is selective. He is selective amongst the Jewish people as to who he will allow to receive the grace. And if, if we go back in separating the Old Testament from the New Testament, uh, Reverend Thompson, uh, he did not extend his grace to me and to my ancestors during the Old Testament era. No, sir. You see? Now, a lot of people forget, forget that. A lot of people forget that. Yes, there are some Religions that are older than Christianity. There are some that are older than Christianity. But they didn't have access to God's grace either. From Exodus to Malachi. In order to have access to God's grace in the Old Testament, a Gentile had to become circumcised, except the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as his or her personal savior, a belief of faith in him. And the men had to be circumcised, circumcised Gentile. So, what can we say? Let's read on. And verse, I like verse 10. Mm. Uh, God doesn't, doesn't leave any questions in the Bible unanswered because he is holding us responsible for our response to what he has revealed. So there are no, there, there are no, un, there are no unanswered questions in the Bible for the church. None. Not a one. Look at verse 10. Here we go. For, 